Oh my God, what's up everybody? Welcome to the Marsh. This is amazing. I'm so glad you came out. I'm from San Diego, uh, so I'm just so ecstatic y'all came out. If there was this much rain, I'd be playing to an audience of five people right now. And, and not because they wouldn't leave their houses, because they, they'd all be dead in the freeway. They don't know how to do it. So um, I thank you for your uh, wherewithal, your kindness for others, and your ability to come to this show. We are So Say We All. We're a 501c3 nonprofit arts and education organization whose mission is to help people tell their stories and tell them better. And I am your host tonight, as well as one of the co-founders, Justin Hudnall. Thank you so much. Um, if this is your first time with us, and it probably is, uh, So Say We All is a veritable, we, we offer a veritable glut of, uh, of education and performance opportunities for free to all performers across California. Um, we have multiple programs. And uh, the one you are at tonight is our marginally most famous one. It has occurred every month for 15 years this month. Who needs a teenager when you have a nonprofit? I like to tell myself, my therapist. Um, I like to say it's the best Hinge or Tinder destination, uh, second only to goat yoga. Welcome to the Vamp Storytelling Showcase. So, I'll just give you a quick rundown so you know what you bought tickets for tonight or were coerced into buying tickets for tonight. So the way the VAMP Storytelling Showcase works is usually every month we have a different theme and then we invite uh, people to send us in first drafts from any corner despite you know, how much or how little experience they have as performers or writers or whatever. Uh, a blind pool will select about six or seven of those stories and then we inflict a horrifying six week boot camp upon those people where they meet as a group one-on-one -on -one with editors, coaches, performance coaches. So no matter what, by the time they're up here, they are so sick of us, but they are chomping at the bit to meet you. Um, now this is clearly a very uh, special show for us. That's the charity shtick of our work I just got through. But tonight we are here at the world famous San Diego, San Francisco Sketch Fest. San Francisco Sketchfest, uh, and it is such an honor. Sketchfest, you're allowed to uh, see famous actors performing with their Journey cover bands. You're allowed to see some of the best stand-up comics indulge their DJ hobbies. So we've decided to almost do away with the charity thing and packed our show with ringers, except even tonight you will meet people who have never done this show before in their entire lives. So. Without any further ado, I'm just going to drop one piece of housekeeping, all right? Because our performers have spent so much time and worked so hard on their stories, we ask that you not interrupt them uh, by having ding-dongs go off, no phones, no pagers, no, no uh, pacemakers, anything that goes beep, please silence those now. Um, and conversely, uh, while we do jokingly, half-jokingly, refer to VAMP as the secular church of stories, don't feel like you have to act like you're in a church tonight. Or to clarify, don't feel like you have to act like you're in a white people church tonight. Uh, please give us your energy, your reactions. Don't heckle. I don't know if San Franciscans heckle. I feel like that goes against the safe spaces thing you guys invited, uh, but don't do that tonight. Uh, but other than that, we're gonna have a great time. Are you ready to hear some true stories? All right, well, tonight you're gonna to be hearing from Mark Schraber, Sam DeSalvo, Dallas McLaughlin, Radhika Rao, Jake Arkey, and cooking us off, welcome to the stage, it's Molly Shapiro. kid a lot. I moved around eight times and was in four different elementary schools by the time I got to sixth grade. Somehow, I managed to figure out how to fit into each place, and then it was time to leave. Even when I landed at my final elementary school, 
It was soon time to transition to middle school the next year. Middle school is the time that no one fits in. <laughs> but we're all trying our hardest and watching each other for cues on how far to roll up our Sophie shorts, what makeup is cool, and how to wear our hair. After all the moves my family made, we landed in Orange County, California, the OC. Most of the girls I went to middle school with looked like many real housewives and had grown up together. They had stick straight platinum blonde hair. They all played soccer and somehow knew exactly how to apply that limited to glitter eyeshadow perfectly on those lids to sparkle. I had been the new kid for so long that I just wanted to do everything I could to fit in, even if it was just gonna be for a short period of time. But compared to them, I was more of the before the makeover of Anne Hathaway in Princess Diaries. I don't know if you've noticed, but I have curly hair. Yes. A little different than those mini housewives. My ringlets showed up sporadically since I was a baby, but middle school is where the frizz-filled spirals really made their debut. And like most people, I always wanted the type of hair I didn't have. The grass was always greener on the other side, they say. Even my mom, with not one curl on her head, did everything to get curls in her hair. Supposedly, I was lucky to have curls, but I too wanted what I didn't have. That Topanga hair, the brush your fingers through the top, straight, long, luscious hair. Those girls who could toss their hair back and forth like an herbal, herbal essence commercial. They had it all. They seemed carefree because their hair didn't take hours to dry or pounds of product to hold together. Having the ability to have your hair air dry and you'd know exactly what it would look like, the dream. But I had curly hair, the kind of hair that hurt when my friends tried to braid it because it was always tangly. So I did all the things I could do to my locks, including straightening it with one of those con air straighteners that barely kept it straight before even leaving the house and putting so much product in it to keep it from frizzing that it always looked wet. And if I did wear it curly, don't you worry, I strained those bangs that I definitely cut myself. <clears throat> I went through years of me trying to look like anything but what I was because I always felt like the new kid trying to fit in with everyone else. For years, I actually got my hair cut as if I had straight hair, pretending I would maintain said haircut, pretending for an hour that I was like everyone else who had straight hair. I walked out of every one of those haircuts feeling excited to fit in at school, so cute and confident, but with the first wash, my fake straight hair would be a distant memory and I would look in the mirror and grab my Pantene mousse to tame my frizz kissed curls. I was the new kid again when I moved to the Bay Area for college, but this time I started noticing more and more people wearing their naturally curly hair. These people looked confident and cool, like Topanga and all those blonde-haired soccer-playing girls I grew up with. I wanted to feel like that, and thus my journey began to find the perfect curly cut. I decided no more fake straight hair. I was in a new place with new people, and it was time for a new me. My first attempt at owning these spirals was with a hairdresser recommended by a friend who was part of the Coiled Locks crew. Hers were slightly different from mine, but coiled nevertheless. My friend's locks were gorgeous, silky smooth, and seemingly effortless to achieve. Just what I wanted. I thought if she sees this hairdresser and her hair looks like that, I'm bound to look just like her. I entered the salon, nervous but excited to be trying something new. Owning the fact that my hair needs were a little bit different than a wash, a cut, and a blow dry. He started out with a similar pattern as my past experiences, but this time he finished it by drying my hair and then cutting each curl. This is how it should be done, people! I left that day more excited about my curly hair, a little more confident, but I washed it out, and as I did, I washed away everything good he had done. 
When I reached back out for help, I found out that he had moved away. He was gone. He made my curls bounce, and then he bounced. I was back to feeling like a middle schooler fumbling with her hair product without a clue in the world. I guess he's allowed to move away, but I was back on the hunt for the perfect cut. A year passed, and it was time to give attention to my ringlets again. Another friend recommended her hairdresser, and I gave her a shot. This hairdresser exuded confidence and told me she loves the ringlet-rich strands and has them herself, but she straightens them. I shared with her what I wanted, and today I wanted something new, curly bangs. The process began, and she began to chop my special spirals. I started to think, oh my god, this is getting short. Oh my god, like really short. Oh my god, shaking underneath my cape, but also not wanting to hurt my hairdresser's feelings. I casually brought up that like, um, hey, I, I, think, I think this is like a little bit too short, um, as my ringlets bounced up to my ears. She assured me it's exactly what we talked about and not to worry. But at the end of our session, I was disappointed and hurried out with a thanks and promptly cried as soon as I left the salon. I texted her feedback a few days later that next time, I don't want it this short. And she responded with, don't worry, hair grows back. <laughs> a brutal blow to this wounded, curly-headed soldier. I lost hope of finding that feeling I'd had one, just once before and a love for my challenging tresses. It took me a while to take another leap into the coil quest, but my desire to feel confident and carefree overtook me. So this time I went rogue and found a salon on my own and booked with a new person said to be a very good at the curly craft. I showed up on the day of my appointment and immediately was told I'd be seeing someone else. Already feeling so nervous and uncomfortable, I asked if this person knows about the twisted tendrils. They confidently told me he sure does. So I went in hoping for the best. A bald man with short, straight salt and pepper hair coming out of the sides of his head walks over to welcome me. I thought, okay, maybe this guy's like the best curly hair cutter I've ever met in my life. Okay, so I share some pictures of the look I'm going for and I tell him, let's do this. I put my trust in him as he hacked away little by little for an hour. I'm trying to stay cool. He knows what he's doing, right? Watching him take scissors to my wet hair over and over again, I'm starting to sweat. He starts blow drying my hair and burns my scalp and my hair starts to turn into the shape of a triangle and the bottom layer is somehow straight and it's so frizzy. I felt like I had steam coming out of my ears and my emotions finally overtook me and I said, stop, you don't know what you're doing, we're done here. I ripped off my cape, I grabbed my stuff and I offered to pay, because I'm nice. He told me it was no charge, so I slammed a $20 bill on the counter and I left. I stood up for my ringlets for the first time. Yeah. Thank you. With the little hope that I had left and adrenaline pumping through my veins, I remembered a friend with the kinkiest of coils gave me a recommendation for her hairdresser. I quickly went to her website and booked an appointment for five days later. It was a Friday morning. I walked into the salon in San Francisco and I was greeted by a full salon of people with all different types of coils and kinks and spirals, both cutting hair and getting their hair cut. The hairdresser I met with was a petite, energetic and kind woman. She started to ask me questions and touch my hair and told me how amazing my luscious locks were and my guard came down. I shared with her, all of my previous awful experiences and what I was hoping for. And she took me in like a lioness cares for her cub. This experience was unlike all of the others. I didn't feel nervous. I felt taken care of. I felt empowered. I felt seen. I felt like I fit in. This woman is and will forever be my fairy godmother. That day, I walked out of the salon loving how I looked for the first time in a long time. I felt carefree and cool. <laughs> I felt like me. 
Being different and trying to fit in has been a consistent part of my life. But as we all learned from the movie Mean Girls, fitting in isn't all it's cracked up to be. And with hair like this, I was born to stand out. Molly Shapiro, everybody. The Haunted Hayride at Griffith Park in Los Angeles is my least favorite haunted event. First of all, it costs too much to sit in the back of a tractor. The narrative of the experience, something only available to those curious enough to visit the website, is about a witch who has cursed the crops. It does not translate well to live performance. <laughs> Also, the entire thing lasts less than 15 minutes, and then it's a sad three-mile hike to get back to the parking lot unless you've also paid extra for the VIP van. <laughs> but you'd never know I didn't like it because I own five t-shirts from the one time I went. <laughs> I love merchandise. <laughs> As any of my friends can attest, the best and least annoying part of attending any event with me is my trip to the merch booth, where I will purchase one, two, sometimes seven t-shirts. I have purchased t-shirts bearing the name of singers I love and singers whose concert I feel it has been a particular torment to get through. At a recent Liz Fair concert, I told my husband, all of these shirts are awful. Before purchasing every one they had in black and a tote bag. And at the Haunted Hayride, I complained about the quality of the attraction, and then I patiently waited in line to spend an extra $75 on everything that fit me. For me, buying merch is a corrective emotional experience. I spent the first years of my life in Moldova, an Eastern European country which is regularly ranked as one of the unhappiest in the world. A place where standing in line for disappointment is ingrained into the soul. Once, my grandmother and I stood in line to buy flavored seltzer water from a street vendor. As soon as I took my first sip, an earthquake hit. My instinct was to run, but my grandmother squeezed my arm in his drink. We waited. We have to return the glass. Imagine surviving an earthquake and not even being able to kick a souvenir. In 1990, we stood in line for shoes. We stood in line for makeup. And sometimes when we got to the front of the line, there would only be more disappointment. A denim vest instead of children's shoes. If we had the rubles, we bought it anyway. We didn't care about colors or sizes or tailors' versions. We cared about being able to trade one pair of two small Levi's jeans for our neighbor's Fila socks, or genuine Puma sneakers that have been rumored to come from a big department store in America. When we left Moldova, we had to give away everything. Clothes, furniture, toys, anything we could not pack had to be dispatched. When we passed immigration in Moscow, the agents took everything that hadn't been checked in his luggage, including our money. When we arrived, we had nothing. A few weeks after we'd settled in, my aunt from New York came to visit. She brought my brother and me shiny plastic jackets. They had buckles on the shoulders and silver zippers on the arms. And in the right conditions, my dad swore they looked as if they had been hewn from genuine imitation leather. My parents sent it to school in these coveted status symbols, and I learned several valuable lessons. The first was that they were meant to resemble the one that Michael Jackson wore in the bad music video. <laughs> the second was that bondage gear doesn't make you any friends in elementary school, <laughs> especially if it's four years out of date and only the teachers recognize it. <laughs> The third was that in America, you could not only watch a music video, but purchase counterfeit relics from its legacy. And on Pier 39, you can even buy t-shirts declaring you survived the big one, whether or not your grandma made you drink an entire seltzer as the ground shook beneath you. 
My love for merch is why my two-bedroom apartment is filled with posters that now live on the floor but will one day be framed and hung up. It's why every corner of a room boasts something I purchased at an event because I love owning a memory that I can hold. For a few months, I have been wearing three VIP wristbands from the Trixie Motel, where I spend two days in the peak month of November. I was only supposed to have one bracelet, but I asked for another each time an employee wondered what they could do to make my stay better while being unable to reduce the price of the tepid poolside nachos. If you know, you know. I never took the bracelets off. Sometimes people assume these bracelets have a deeper meaning, that I wear them to bring awareness for a disease. The disease is wanting to hold on to an experience for as long as possible, no matter what it is. If you come to my house, you won't have to pay an entrance fee, but you will have to take a tour of all the things that mean something to me, many of which have never been available in stores. That includes a picture of Katie Woodell, who is famous because she was my favorite manager and whose photo I stole off the office wall of greatness <laughs> before I left corporate America forever. Your tour will also include a tooth that my dentist had was forced to extract after a root canal failed. It's better. If I had to spend four hours and $3,000 getting my mouth fixed, I wasn't leaving without something to show for it. When my gallbladder was removed in 2020, I convinced myself that it was worth it to go under the knife during a global pandemic because I had negotiated with the surgeon to keep the stone that prompted its excision. I will show it to you. You can hold it and take pictures if you'd like. I'll probably insist on it. I would have brought it with me tonight, but I didn't want to get mobbed. As I was changing into my hospital gown for surgery, I snuck several pairs of grippy socks, the number of which you do not need to know, from the equipment cabinet I was left alone with. Then I handed them out as parting gifts for visiting friends, a piece of merchandise from an important event in my life a reminder that I had not only survived, but triumphed. If I knew how, I would have embroidered Mark Live, bitch, on them for posterity. I will show you my signed photo of Arsenio Hall. This is not a man that I am a fan of. When I saw the photo in a vintage shop in Las Vegas, I thought, I should call my friend Erica. Then, oh no, she died six months ago. Then, well, that's $35 I don't have to spend. And then I went back and I bought it. Because that's what friends do. They buy merch for the friends who can no longer buy merch for themselves. <laughs> Last year, Heclina, a drag icon on San Francisco legend, died. When I went to her memorial, I marveled not only at the sense of community she inspired, or the fact that a single person thought it was okay to sing two songs at an already four hour long service, but also at the sheer number of items I could buy or pre-order to remember her. <laughs> I will die on the hill that there should be more merch at funerals. <laughs> and you should be able to get a t-shirt of me dying on that hill <laughs> at my funeral. And you should be able to pay with a credit card. Not to keep harping on death, but some of the last words my grandma ever said to me was, Mark, I am dying. <laughs> the dying part wasn't a surprise. She had been slowly declining for weeks. But this moment of lucidity was unexpected. And because I am both trained in psychology and love my grandma very much, I decided not to tell her she was being silly or that she was going to get better. So I put my hand on hers and I said, I know. Come closer, she said. I have something to tell you. In general, my grandmother did not traffic in secrets because if she had something to tell you, she was going to say it right to your face. She did not speak fluent English, but her two most used phrases in the English language were, oh my God. <laughs> and Mark, shut up. <laughs> Just a few days before, she had told my husband that she had been grateful to him for marrying me because with my laugh and personality, 
none of us were sure it was ever going to happen. And I had to translate it. <laughs> For her to want to say something just to me, that was huge. Could this be the moment my grandmother would impart the wisdom of the universe to me? She clutched my hand in one of hers. In the other, she held a stuffed cow in a lab coat that I had purchased from the hospital gift shop for $24.99. The lab coat specified that the cow worked at UCSF, and that made it special. She held out the cow to me and slowly said, Mark, you are fat. Like this cow. It is time for you to lose some weight. Then she closed her eyes and fell into a coma. She never spoke again. The next day, I found myself asking my aunt if it'd be okay for me to have my grandmother's wedding ring to wear. That's a great idea, my aunt said. She'd already taken all the other jewelry. Do you want to take it now? Maybe knowing someone will have it will make it easier for her to go. My grandma died two hours later. I walked out the hospital with only the story of her final hilarious insult and the ring, which I could bring home and wear and make meaning of. With those two things, her death ceased being just a sad thing that happened to so many grandmas. It had become an experience, an event, complete with commemorative merchandise. <laughs> Mark Schreiber! In 1997, I was seven years old and living in Reno, Nevada, a timid child in a city made for reckless adults. I attended a small Catholic elementary school where I acquired a lot of guilt and no friends. I had thick wild hair that had never been told no. I rarely spoke to anyone, and if I did, it was about 80s sitcoms. I can't blame my classmates for not reaching out, have you ever tried to make friends by asking someone how badly they want to kiss Kirk Cameron? <laughs> Even if Kirk was the most doggedly Christ-like figure to have a crush on, the kids in my class were not about it. I was looking for a way to be seen. Since I idolized 80s television, I figured the quickest way to garner attention was to become famous. I had seen Michael J. Fox's E! True Hollywood story enough times to know I needed my parents to take me to auditions. Reno, as you might have guessed, not a hotbed for entertainment. <laughs> My dad once told me he was going to take me to an audition for Pocahontas 2. I was obsessed with Pocahontas and didn't know what cultural appropriation was at the time, so I was thrilled. What my dad actually meant was that we were going to go to Home Depot, a casino, and the dump. At the end of the night, he told me the auditions had closed early. It would be years before I realized my dad used Pocahontas II as a ruse to get me to go on an errand run. But I still felt that my shot at Hollywood was just around the river bend. <laughs> my parents tried to deflect my entertainment dreams again and again. Why don't you play basketball? They'd ask. To be fair, Michael J. Fox did play basketball in Teen Wolf, and I think they thought with all the hair on my back, I had a better shot at becoming a teenage werewolf than a child actor. <laughs> However, my fevered dreams of fame persisted. Though Michael J. Fox was a prominent influence, he was a figure of the past. The real beacons of 90s success were the Olsen twins. They never knew a day in their lives without fame. From nine months old, their parents whored them out for money on endeavors like Full House and It Takes Two, starring Kirstie Alley and a surprisingly hot Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> I loved every fucking second of it. 1997 was a magical year in our house because of one thing. It was the year my family got the internet. Yeah. My dad could buy stocks and play bridge with strangers online. My mom could buy pants and play bridge with strangers online. And me, 
I could create a whole new identity, one that was charming and famous and play bridge with strangers online. <laughs> with my parents fully against my entertainment career, I was forced to take my acting chops to the cyber streets. At that time, AOL had this portal called Kids Only, a place meant for minors to chat with other kids instead of creepy old men because slapping the moniker kids only on a chat room would be a total deterrent for pedophiles. <laughs> this meant that I had to undergo a seminal moment for any millennial, choosing, <clears throat> choosing my first screen name. <laughs> I had landed on the handle, Angel Sweet Smiles stylized with the A's and the S's capitalized to highlight that ass. <laughs> For me, kids only chat rooms were a gold mine of potential fans ready to become my audience. And I entertained them the only way I knew how, by impersonating the Olsen twins. <laughs> you might be thinking, but Sam, there are two Olsen twins, hence the twins, and you would be correct. But to combat that fact, I went boldly into these chat rooms and spoke the truth. That in reality, there was only one Olsen named Mary Ashley and I was her. <laughs> this is how a lot of those chats went. Hey everyone, my agent asked me to reach out to my fans and I love you guys. So Mary Ashley Olsen here. Feel free to ask me questions about Full House, to Grandmother's House We Go, Billboard Dad, whatever. What, but aren't there two? No, they just say there is, so I get paid more, but there's just one, me, Mary Ashley. Do you like eight equals 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 D? <laughs> Maybe. In the age of internet naivete, I was able to sustain this charade for months. I loved getting rewarded in frequent IMs, in Neopets Gold, and shout outs in AOL profiles. I had made it, I was famous. I was basically the first influencer. It was an exhilarating feeling of acceptance I had never received before. Even though I was living a lie to get it, I wanted it to last as long as possible. This was fitting, considering lying about identity is the plot to pretty much every Olsen twins movie. <laughs> Meanwhile at school, I tried to keep a low profile on my newfound fame. I was terrified one of my classmates might start talking about how they'd spoken to Mary Ashley the night before. Then again, my classmates were more interested in Pokemon, Men in Black, and Puff Daddy. You know, cool kid stuff. Pretty much no one in my class was scouring chat rooms to talk to the star of how the West was fun. This was around the time my class was going to make first communion. I remember thinking the biggest blessing of all this was the privilege to eat during church, something I'd gotten detention for before. Now it was encouraged, hallelujah. Before you can do First Communion though, you have to make your first confession. This involves you and a priest going to a room alone together and telling him why you've been a bad little girl. <laughs> why is the Catholic Church like this? I knew what I was doing with Mary Ashley was technically lying, but if I told that to the priest, I had to stop doing it. Uh -huh. So in confession, I split the difference and simply said, I've done some bad stuff. <laughs> like I was a mob boss trying to explain his career to his young son. <laughs> the priest gave me a couple Hail Marys to say, I remained an AOL legend, bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> then one fateful day, the heavens came crashing down. I came home from second grade and made a beeline to the computer in my parents' office to greet my loyal fans. <laughs> it was then I discovered the internet had been disconnected. Hyperventilating from the shock, I asked my parents what was going on. And my mom replied, maybe your agent can restore the internet for us. <laughs> it turns out that I had been reported by some haters for impersonating a public figure. They didn't say figures, so I guess mission accomplished. <laughs> this cost my family their entire AOL account. We'd have to wait a whole week for a new disc to arrive in the mail. Every fiber of my being was embarrassed. 
I had been found out and by my parents, no less. They didn't understand my dreams. They laughed at them. But through that cloak of humiliation, I realized that maybe I had actually gotten exactly what I wanted. I was looking for a way to be seen and it had worked. My parents were the tabloids and they were talking about me. <laughs> and thus a star was born. <laughs> After my star turn as Mary Ashley in the 90s, my junior catfishing day ceased. But I never stopped seeking that attention. I still use the internet as a stage for my comedic antics for years. I even started writing song parodies at one point. Some of my hits included a parody of Avril Lavigne's I'm With You that was called I Like Food. It was pretty derivative of Weird Al's Eat It, but I never claimed to be him, and that babe is growth. Sam DeSalvo, everybody! Fucking fuck, fuck that fucking kid. This is what I heard as Jason kicked open the door to the green room, raced past me in a fury and threw his sailor hat into his locker before kicking the locker door shut. Bad show, I asked. Fuck you, Jason replied, kicking the locker again and this time putting a dent in it. He then hastily fixed a smudge of makeup on his face, grabbed his sailor hat out of his broken locker and headed backstage for his next cue. Jason and I were both mimes. Mimes at SeaWorld's Sea Lion and Otter Show. <laughs> Jason had only been there at the show for about a month and had finally had one too many run-ins with shitty kids. And unfortunately, kids were pretty much the worst part of the job. If you've ever been to SeaWorld and seen the Sea Lion and Otter Show, then you've probably seen the guy who comes out into the crowd before the show starts and messes with everybody. Most people know them as Biffs, and for most people, it's their favorite part of the show. I was a Biff. I was your favorite part of the show. I started in 1999, and back then the show had an island theme, and the pre-show performer wasn't a mime or a biff, we were called Juan Ho. I was hired after my audition where I did an impression of a roly-poly bug doing an impression of Shamu. I was 19, I came up with the idea in the parking lot before the audition, and it killed. The guy who trained me was one of the best pre-show performers there ever was. He was quick and wacky and agile, and he picked up immediately that I was none of those things. I was Buster Keaton to his Charlie Chaplin, the deadpan goof who could take a fall that looked so real it probably was. He once told me in rehearsal, you have an incredible gift that I don't have. You can make 2,500 people laugh just by raising your eyebrows. He was right. <laughs> Summers at Sea Lion and Otter were the best back in those days. We would do six shows a day and everyone would be filled to capacity. In a day, we'd perform for about 12,000 people. We had an incredible stable of bits already put together through the years, like the one, two, three. Sounds just like the crowd. We do kid in the moat. That's where you desperately tried to convince a little kid to jump into the moat. Build a family where you would grab someone's camera from the crowd, bring them up and start grabbing random people from all over the stadium to be in their family photo. If you set up a white couple with a black kid, it always got a good laugh. If you put a black and a white parent with an Asian kid, utter pandemonium. My favorite thing was always the blindfold. This is where you pick a guy from the audience, you have him stand in the middle of the walkway against the glass, you tie a bandana around his eyes like a blindfold, raise his arms in the air, and then you slowly walk away. <laughs> then you lean against the wall and do nothing. Then you leave the stadium. <laughs> the guy just stands there like an idiot, it's great. 
For years, we had the freedom to try new things, improvise, develop new bits, and it was probably the most fun I'd ever had on stage. But now, a decade later, my legendary eyebrows were covered in white, and I squinted through show after show, replying my makeup every hour. The show switched themes to a submarine, and we weren't biffs, we weren't Juan Ho's, we were mimes, and it sucked. Like, really sucked. <laughs> None of us were trained mimes. We didn't know how to mime, and none of the jokes or bits we did were mime-esque. We never pulled on a fake rope or got trapped in a fucking box. or Whatever it is mimes do, I don't know because I never was one. I was just a chubby comedian who could take a fall, and now all of a sudden someone said, put white on your face. Literally, for this mime year, nothing changed in the pre-show, except now we had white face on. They were fine if we talked. It made no sense. <laughs> but it did piss off kids. Holy shit, do kids hate mimes. And let's be fair, everyone hates mimes. You've never walked into a room and seen a mime and were like, hell yeah. Your first reaction was to hurt the mime. And the kids did. They would punch us, kick us, pour water on us, throw food at us. The first few times a kid kicks you in the knee, you just try to play it off and ignore it because what a little shit, right? Their parents never cared and most of the time they just laughed harder at that than anything else. The fifth time you get kicked, you learn to fight back. Like I would take off my hat, I'd dip it in the moat, fill it with water, and then dump it on a child's head. We'd dump out the kid's popcorn, or we'd lock them outside of the stadium. The back and the forth was a staple of the show, but you had to really hate the kids to sell it. We became mimes because we had a new head of entertainment. He was an idiot. His only experience in entertainment was that he played trumpet. He had worked his way up through the ranks at SeaWorld San Antonio, and they thought that maybe, just maybe, he could come in and give some of the shows a jolt. Spoiler alert, he did the opposite. He was a short man who demanded that his word was final and cared very little for what anyone else thought. You know, the best temperament for creative group endeavors. His terrible leadership was one thing, but his ideas were bad. I mean, hell, we were mimes all of a sudden. And after a few months of being mimes, lockers being dented, kids beating us while parents laughed, we decided it was time to revolt. Quietly, of course. One person. It began simply enough. We tried to do actual mime routines. Pulling the rope, the box, whatever. It didn't matter because we were bad at them and actual mime bits aren't funny. We started to get written up by our bosses. So it was decided that a member of leadership would be out there to watch every show. Naturally, we took it further. Some of the mimes would put white circles around their noses instead of all white face or their mouths. One mime just did white makeup on his neck. I started to add facial hair to my makeup. <laughs> More write-ups and none of us cared, mainly because they couldn't fire all of us, but they did fire Jason because he kicked a kid. <laughs> 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 we pressed on, and we began the greatest stretch of shows that were ever done in the history of Sea Lion. We called them the Dare Shows. In our dressing room, there was a whiteboard, and on it, it was your job to write out a dare for the mime in the next show. Whatever that dare was, you had to do it, because we would stay after our shifts to watch and make sure. For example, for the entire show, you have to keep fake crying. For the entire show, you have to act like you're having light stomach pain. For the entire show, you have to wear a woman's bikini top and never make reference to it. Mouth curse words when asking the audience to applaud volunteers. My two favorite dares came near the end. I dared one of the mimes that for the entire show, they had to start a bit and then halfway through, give up on it. No payoff, no reference, just give up and move on. It was perhaps the hardest I and the sound man have ever laughed. The other was when I was there during a completely packed house to walk to the very top of the stadium and walk down to the bottom by going through each and every row, acting like I was looking for a seat. By the time I got to the bottom, the show had started. By the time I got to the office, I was told to go see our new head of entertainment. I walked into his office and he informed me that we would, he would be imposing a new rule at Sea Lion. We would all have to do the same exact pre-show. No changes, no improv, no going with the flow. From start to finish, there would be a set script and we'd all have to follow it or we'd be asked to leave the company. He'd seen the dare board and he wasn't having it. Two days later, I saw his script. What he didn't understand was that I, as you can tell, am long-winded. 
I also don't appreciate people who don't know how to do what I do telling me how to do it. So I sat down and wrote a three-page email to every person in leadership in my department and in the animal training department as well, explaining why this idea of making us all doing the same pre-show wasn't only a bad idea, but it was impossible. You don't have the same crowd 15 minutes before a show on a Tuesday in February as you might on July 3rd. If there was no one in the crowd, you couldn't do build a family unless you were trying to build my family, which was just me and my mom. And no one would laugh at that except for my dad. I had several examples, well thought out points in a history only a decade of doing the show could bring. The next afternoon, I was told the head of entertainment wanted to see me in his office before the nighttime sea lion show. I walked into his office and sitting across from his desk were the other three bosses of entertainment, all under him of course, but any one of these four could have fired me immediately. They didn't, they sat, I sat. And that's when the head of our department cursed me out for the next 25 minutes. After the first profanity-laced sentence, I looked back at the other three bosses who all looked like they'd seen a ghost. They clearly weren't expecting this and did not look like they were enjoying it either. I had a notepad to take notes, but all I wrote was, Dick. <laughs> he continued to berate me in my simple opinions. He told me I wasn't half as good as I thought I was. He called me an asshole several times, even going so far as to say that I had fucked up his vision for the show just by being there. He ended by telling me that if I wanted to give him my opinion on his shows again, I could come to his office, close the door, and say it to his face, because then we'd see what would happen. No one moved. No one said a word. Then he asked if I had any questions. I said, no, I have to go do a show now. I then stood up and pulled an imaginary rope to get out of the room. <laughs> I heard a giggle from one of the bosses. <laughs> I then went down to my cubicle and wrote an email to the head of HR about what had just happened. I CC'd everyone in the room on it except for the dick himself and pushed send. A couple weeks passed and I received a call from the head of HR. He wanted to ask me more about my email and have me come in to give an official statement. I was then called by the other three bosses who were in that room and they told me they had also just given a statement defending me. Apparently, the dick had also written an email to HR claiming that I was the one who called him names and that I challenged him to a fight. <laughs> he also assumed his underlings would have his back, but what he failed to understand was that he was a dick. <laughs> he made every show worse and everyone hated him. After a few days, the punishments were handed down. I was suspended without pay for a week due to emailing all the people I did, and my work email access was revoked until further notice. The dick, on the other hand, got to keep his email access. However, he was never allowed to be alone in a meeting ever again. And if he was, the door to his office had to remain completely open. He was restricted from contacting me without approval from my immediate supervisor, and he was never allowed to receive a promotion within the company ever again. The other three bosses got me a thank you card and had everyone sign it. A few months later, the dick went back to San Antonio and we had a new head of entertainment who announced that at the end of the year, we'd be changing the Sea Lion show entirely. It would no longer be mimes. It was a small victory, but at this point, I was done. I quietly bowed out after 11 years on the stage and with white makeup dripping off my sweaty face. That is until 2012, when they asked me to fill in for a couple of weeks after they had to fire a Biff for something. When the time came to hire a new Biff, they just asked me to stay on. I just got married and we could definitely use the extra cash, so I said yes. The show did stay a bit more structured than in my original run, but overall it was just like being 19 again, except now I was in my 30s. I was pretty old for a Biff, a physically demanding job that always required jumping and dancing on a concrete stage while being completely soaked almost the entire time. You ran up and down the stairs for most of the pre-show and now you didn't stop moving for about 40 minutes as Biff's had a very prominent role in the actual show as well. After a few years and many nights of me coming home in tears because of back pain, knee pain, or just general soreness, I finally had to call it quits. After 14 years, I had done the job longer than anyone ever had. I had done more pre-shows than anyone in history, almost 9,000. I was tired. I was too old. But instead of accepting my resignation, they asked me to become the boss of the Biffs, to teach and train the newbies. So I did. Not before one last show. My goodbye show. In 2016, I walked from the top of the stadium to the bottom of the stadium, going row by row, <laughs> tripping over people, spilling drinks and popcorn, never saying a word until I got to the top of the stage and for one last time said,
That was Dallas McLaughlin. never wanted to get divorced. I'm not opposed to the idea per se, I just don't like changes. It was sometime in January 2015 when my now ex, Al, told me that he didn't want to do our marriage anymore. Apparently it was my fault. I had changed too much. He had hoped that I would stay in academia, which is where we met, but instead I chose to return to the arts. He had assumed I'd have the same schedule as I did when I was a grad student, but I was finally hitting my stride as a theater professional, which meant working nights and weekends. He'd hoped at least I could have had a more stable income, but my dream mandated the instability of being a gig worker. And that was it. He dumped me, blocked me from social media, and suddenly my life, friend circles, living situation, all changed in a manner of days. Believe me when I say, I don't like change. Growing up, we almost never moved. I stayed with my folks until my mid twenties, until I absolutely had to move to do the rightful Indian thing, get a PhD from an Ivy League school. <laughs> and when it came to it, I didn't even really want to get married. I would have happily stayed partnered with my ex without the marriage paperwork. But when the matter of permanent residency came up, I kinda had to. Al's immigration paperwork was being processed around the same time that I needed to process mine. You're fortunate if you think the alphanumerics L1, F1, H1B are elements in the periodic tables. They aren't. They are highly stratified, hard to understand without an expensive immigration lawyer, immigration categories that you must fit into if you are to stay in the United States of America. As a theater teaching artist from India working with a small nonprofit, I didn't have a hope in hell of becoming a permanent resident anytime soon. But Al, a European professor, could manage to get a green card in six months. So that was my decision. One marriage, please, in return for the right to remain in the United States. <laughs> and so began the next chapter of my married life. We tried to maintain status quo and, and say we were each other's partners. Um, but when our colleagues in San Diego then started to assume we're in same-sex relationships and somewhere along the line we had to counter that we weren't, it all got awkward because San Diego. <laughs> we started transitioning to my husband and my wife. Honestly, I had no idea how to be someone's wife. I never had a roadmap for a happy marriage. My parents' marriage was as functional as Prince Charles and Lady Di back in the day. Good people individually, but terrible when they were around each other. I'm not sure I ever heard them being in a conversation for more than a few minutes before an argument would erupt. My sister and I would secretly fantasize about my parents getting a divorce, but they never did. Striving to go for the opposite, I made it my job to make, keep my marriage peaceful. The key was to avoid conflict and blow ups at all costs. Even if it meant we eventually stopped communicating. It was a worthy effort, but the experiment failed with a capital F. There I was, 11 years of faithful monogamy, checking the divorce box now on my hiring forms. It took under $100 to get married and several times the amount to get divorced. The cost of heartbreak and grief is well priceless. A year and a half passed and the grief gave way to occasional dating. But when my 40th birthday coincided with Trump's inauguration and the premature passing of my dear aunt, suddenly my being had a very particular response. Life is short, friends. If women's rights were gonna be taken away soon, it was now or never. This divorcee was gonna become a total, 
unapologetic ho. <laughs> so yes, the post-divorce healing that followed President Trump's election was indeed sexual, occurring in bedrooms, living rooms, national parks, caves, recently popular co-ed bathrooms in San Francisco, abandoned hallways, I was the quintessential 40-something perimenopausal Indian Ali Wong. I was the farthest I could be from monogamy that I had enjoyed for so many years. My adopted homeland America and I were on parallel journeys in 2017 and 18, uncharted territories, a constant flow off. I can't believe that happened. There were no rules. It wasn't until I met Ray, smack in September 2018, a few months before the midterm elections, that I felt a traditional tug from the heart. It was rather a shock. Ray could not have been more different than I. He was like this all-American blonde Superman. He spoke a particular brand of English that I didn't understand. He said, pumpkin a lot. He wore cologne and sports jackets on dates. He opened the door for me. He was constantly sending me memes and videos of himself in the car, in the shower, in his office, in the gym. He proudly shared that he had been fat most of his life and through the church of CrossFit had transformed himself and was now a total zaddy. He had zero college degrees but possessed more unapologetic Gen X white cis male privilege than I had ever encountered in my whole life. I could have sworn that the birds chirped and all the animals cheered when he woke up every morning. Now, if he had one weakness, it was he wasn't very good in bed. But boy, did he have the confidence. <laughs> when I tried to address it to him, he just threw up his hands, shrugged his shoulders and said, yeah, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was his adventure into the great brown unknown. <laughs> and he was my exotic other. Somewhere along the line, I guess that he may have voted for Donald J. Trump. And he finally fessed up, pointing out that in his defense, he wasn't a Republican, he was a Libertarian. <laughs> Wait, what? I think that's worse. But by that time, I was deep in the throes of this very unusual pairing. While families were sparring over politics at Thanksgiving dinners all over America, I, an immigrant, told myself that it would be my very bipartisan contribution to U.S. democracy to work across the aisle in the bedroom. <laughs> I'm going to take credit for the fact that Ray said he forgot to vote in the 2018 midterm elections. <laughs> yeah, as a permanent resident, I still couldn't vote. But I fought on the front lines. I prevented one Trump enthusiast from voting. I had bad sex with a libertarian for way longer than I should have. For you, America! Yeah! Yes, surprise, surprise, that relationship didn't last. Um, by our six month anniversary, communication started to fade. And when I confronted him, he told me he wanted to start seeing someone else. It stung, but somewhere deep inside, I knew that the situation ship needed to end sooner or later. Second time around though, of being dumped, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was never the initiator of breakups. I was a textbook case of repeating my parents' mistakes. Compromise hard just to keep a mediocre thing going. It was a worthy, albeit painful lesson. It wasn't long before Ray's new lady friend dumped him and he got the shingles. <laughs> he got back in touch to make amends and I accepted his apology. We are still friends on social media and he continues to be my one and only libertarian contact. I wish I could say that I learned my lesson just then. In the years that followed, I stayed in some jobs for far too long, in some problematic living situations for longer than I should have, 
and definitely in some pandemic clothing options for way too long. Yes, I have had a hard time breaking up with the status quo, even when it became a roadblock to my happiness. But here we are in 2024, and I am ready to welcome change, even if it's inconvenient. I finally braved the paperwork and bureaucracy and became an American citizen. This November will be the first opportunity I have to influence an, a US election as a voter. Once more, I am ready to report for duty, America. Let's stir it up. Thank you. Ready, go. San Francisco, can you give it up for all of our performers this evening? They've been just amazing. Thank you so much. New Year's Day 2011. I'm in my mid-20s, unemployed and broke. Utterly desperate, I walk into the Corvette Diner looking for a job I heard was currently open. Disc jockey. The Corvette Diner is like a Johnny Rockets on mega steroids, a massive eating establishment that trades in good old fashioned whitewashed Americana from the 1950s and 60s. The only anachronistic feature is a giant poster of Guy Fieri giving the diner a seal of approval with a big frosted tip thumbs up. Waitresses with big attitudes and soda jerks with even bigger regrets <laughs> are required to take monikers like Trudy, Maud, and Buster, all hearkening back to simpler times. It's the kind of place that makes you feel like everything's gonna be okay, so long as you keep sucking on that peanut butter hopscotch milkshake. Walking up to Fred, the lead disc jockey and a lifer at the Corvette, I made my DJing intentions known. Fred with his sweet smile, Tommy Bahama shirt, and khaki cargo shorts asked if I'd ever DJed. I hadn't, but I didn't say this. Instead, I responded, spin all the time, dude. <laughs> Great, Fred replied. And I assume you're familiar with 50s and 60s top 10 billboard hits? Before I even questioned if I should tell the truth, another straight up lie popped out. Am I ever? That stuff is my jam. Okay, so maybe it was a half lie. At the time, I knew the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, and Elvis, but flipping through the Corvette's playbook of songs was useless. Still, I picked a few tracks at random, pure shots in the dark, and Fred threw them on the Corvette's Airwaves iTunes circa 2009. And I sweated to those oldies for nearly 20 minutes. By the time song number five played, Fred closed his eyes. <sighs> oh my goodness, he exhaled. This is one of the best playlists that anyone has ever put together when applying for this job. And thus, DJ Etch-A-Sketch was born. I didn't know what I was doing, but somehow, some way, I'd found my niche along with my silky radio voice. Hey, groovy dudes, hep cats, and boogie down babes, grab yourself a cherry cola and head on over to where everyone is working at the car wash. It is without a doubt one of the best jobs I've ever had in my entire life, proving that it is usually does work out for mediocre white guys with marginal to zero talent. <laughs> but I couldn't be DJ at your sketch forever. After a year at the Corvette, I left San Diego for the Bay Area, subcoming to a big boy career. With a heavy heart, I put away my turntables, iTunes circa 2010, and instead focused on being a stupid adult with mature responsibilities. But something was missing. My world was thrown off balance. I intensely craved that 
elusive high I had experienced at the Corvette. The problem was I didn't know where to get my fix in the bay. I tried to drown my sorrows and desires by going to certain bars on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays, bars that only advertised one thing, karaoke. (laughs) My routine consisted of ordering a drink, or two or three, uh, stirring up some liquid courage, submitting my nom de plume of MC Pasty to the KJ, then ripping loose on the mic with an old school Jay-Z track, give it to me, parentheses, I just wanna love you, you know what it's like. When the Remy's in the system, ain't no telling, will I fuck em, will I diss em, that's what they be yelling. I'm a pimp by blood, not relay shun. Y'all replay some, I'd be chase some, what? Because when you're a nice Jewish boy from the hardcore streets of Salt Lake City, Utah, you have to find a rhythmic way to express yourself. But once again, reality bit. Showing me what happens if you rock and roll all night and only go to your grown-up place of employment every other day. MC Pasty had to retire. But my cravings continue to gnaw even grow more intense. Around this time, one of my San Francisco roommates, Rita, worked for a startup. Shocking, I know. This startup was moving their offices into an old historic building in downtown. Calm down, you guys. This happens all the time. And this move came with a party, and this party came with the search for a DJ. Even though I owned no equipment, and it had been several years since I had played at the Corvette, I offered my services. Rita was very generous. Jake, we're going to rent you whatever you need. What is on your list? Besides an iPod mini? No idea. Being a real DJ with an actual sound system was way out of my league, but not wanting to sound like a novice, I answered, you get me the biggest, baddest, most expensive system you can afford. Wish granted. (laughs) When I walked into the venue that day, I was greeted by a gargantuan AV system, three stories tall. Subwoofers begat baby subwoofers with grandbaby subwoofers. There were two technicians who were going to be monitoring my levels all night long, both of who bombarded me with questions about XLRs and RCAs and other technical jargon. And I kept asking how to plug my headphones into the the thingy that connects to the laptop device. You, You know, guests had already started to arrive. Things needed to get started pronto. I got this, you guys. I got this kept coming out of my mouth, even though I didn't have it or even know what it was. With one nervous finger, I hit the space bar on my laptop. (laughs) And just like my audition at the Corvette, the power of Guy Fieri blessed me (laughs) because when I pressed that button, beautiful music came out of the speakers. Guests moseyed their way onto the dance floor. The joint got jumping. DJ Etch-A-Sketch had been resurrected. As the cutoff time for the party rolled around, Rita approached me with light in her eyes. Can you keep playing till like three in the morning? I gave a cocky nod of my head. Pass me that Costco-sized bottle of whiskey and we have a deal. I took a long slug off the bottle, then without waiting for any other beats to drop, I promptly blacked out. (laughs) The next thing I remember was waking up in a living room surrounded by family portraits of people I did not recognize. (laughs) I hadn't the faintest notion of where I was, except the house was not my own. My wallet was empty, cell phone dead, and I was missing a shoe. Exiting the house, I approached the first person I saw, no doubt fearful of interacting with me in my current state of complete chaos. Where am I? I asked. Oakland, the bewildered passerby informed me. I didn't live in Oakland. 
When I finally made my way back to San Francisco, I plugged in my phone to see about 20 text messages and 30 missed calls. Various people, friends, neighbors, all had tried to contact me. The last voicemail, however, was from a woman I didn't know and had no memory of meeting. Hey, Jake, or should I say, DJ Etch a Sketch? My name is Natalie, and um, I got your contact info from the party last night, and I just loved how you jumped on the table, busted some moves, and rapped for all of us. Oh, no. Flashback, it all rushed into my head. DJ Etch-A-Sketch undergoing a Jekyll and Hyde transformation into MC Pasty, who snatched the microphone, sauntered onto the dance floor, and spit a classic flow like drunk off Chris, mommy on E, can't keep a little oil hands off me, both in the club, I singing off key, and I wish I never met her at all. I couldn't have, but I did. I know in my heart of hearts it was true. The voicemail continued, um, I'm an event coordinator, and I'm looking to hire a DJ for our corporate retreat at the Ritz-Carlton next month. <laughs> Holy shit, I booked another gig at the Ritz-Carlton. Then it hit me. Even at this point in my short DJing career, I knew I couldn't be an embarrassment or go hog wild at this next gig. If I was going to be paid to DJ, the least I could do was stay sober and remain professional throughout the event. For the Ritz-Carlton party, I purchased my own equipment, arrived on time, and it was a well-behaved gentleman on the mixer. As the night went on, Natalie found me in the DJ booth. So she started. When are you going to get drunk and rap on the mic like you did at the last party? My face flushed red. Oh, I don't do that anymore. I managed. That's not really who I am as a DJ. But she trailed off. That's the whole reason I hired you. Well, if that wasn't my cue, I don't know what was. I immediately took a shot, then another. No chaser necessary. Picking up the mic, I hit the space bar and let the glorious beat drop as I made my way to the dance floor. Thank you. Oh my gosh, give it up for Jake Arkey, everybody. He is the co-founder of So Say We All, and give it up for all of your storytellers tonight. Are you not entertained? Are you not? We hope you are so impressed, and I hope that you at some point this evening had the thought, I can do this too. You surely can. Find us on our socials. So thank you again to Molly Shapiro, Mark Schraber, Sam DeSalvo, the Dallas McLaughlin, Radhika Rao, and again, my co-founder, Jake Arkey. Thank you to Sketchfest. Thank you to The Marsh. And thank you for being here tonight. Stick around. Have a nightcap. Make some friends. Good night. <laughs>